welcome to the December Great Expectations Community Meeting. Lovely, lovely to see you all. Uh, what we're going to be going over today are, um, as always, we'll start with some community celebrations and pro product roadmap updates. Uh, I have just a quick announcement after that. Um, and then just uh, about PRs and 1.0. Um, and then James will talk a bit about GX uh, 1.0 as well. And then we have special guests today, uh, Jose and Pedro, uh, who will be talking about how they uh, utilize great expectations within Lakehouse Engine. So let's go ahead and get things kicked off. First of all, community celebrations. As always, uh, we really want to recognize folks who are in the community, helping one another, um, and supporting others who are looking for questions and trying to, you know, uh, figure things out. And um, these are some of the folks who uh, helped others since the last community meeting uh, to solve their problems. Um, special shout out to Lori, Han, Amari, and David, who um, helped multiple folks. And then, uh, Anthony, would you want to jump in with some contribution highlights? Oh. I don't think he's made it he's on. not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, these are some of the contribution highlights uh, from this month um, from users, and I wasn't prepared to talk about it, so I don't... Does anyone have anything they want to jump in and say about these? Okay, well, thank you um, to both of these uh, Great Expectations users who uh, contributed and, um, you know, these kind of things are what is helping us to just keep making things better. So thank you so much. Okay. And product roadmap updates for Nan. Take it away. I would love to do that. I just saw Anthony just popped in a few. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, oh, whoops, going the wrong way. Anthony. Sure. <laughs> yeah, would you Sorry. like to talk a little bit about the contribution highlights? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we got two two cool ones um, this this month. Uh, a new expectation, um, which I think is uh, for a specific application. Uh, Rohan um, wrote this one. It's expect column expect multi column date time difference to be less than two months. Um, we'd like them to be you know specifically named. So uh, that's that's why why they they start to get a little long. But uh, yeah, so it's two different columns. You expect that. Uh, the date time in column uh, A is within two months of, of column B. Uh, so you think of things like invoicing, uh, financial calculations. Um, also, like, is the server timestamp too far from the uh, device timestamp? Um, so cool, cool new expectation. Second one here is a bug fix. Uh, um, the user Felipe Jesus uh, found an issue where MySQL uh, doesn't allow temporary tables to be used twice in the same query. And so the expectation was working on every other backend, but MySQL, um, it was not working. So we wrote a uh, different query using a window function specifically for MySQL. Uh, and so now you can use that expectation uh, and it's the compound columns to be unique expectation. So two great uh, contributions. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for those. Awesome, thanks so much, Anthony. We're talking through that. And now we can pass it to Hernan. Yeah. Hi, hi, folks. I don't get a chance to see you very often. I'm Hernan Alvarez, uh, VP of Product uh, here at Great Expectations. They they keep me locked away um, and don't let me don't let me out very often. Um, but there's a few different things that we have going on. Uh, you've seen, uh, if you've been paying attention to this section, usually presented by Eric, um, you've been seeing the progress in the cloud side. And a couple of the, a couple of the important themes is uh, we focused heavily on the, the ability to create the core objects within the domain model, whether those expectation suites and uh, checkpoints and and data assets. And uh, but we ha we hadn't actually 
um, giving it full CRUD operation. So now you're seeing that coming up in the roadmap with renaming of uh, suites and checkpoints, um, and as well as editing data assets coming up. Um, then the uh, then we had also done some 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 stuff along the lines of making it very easy for folks to onboard the cloud with creating default objects when they created their first their first data asset. So we would create an expectation suite and a checkpoint for them automatically. Uh, that's a really great experience if you're doing um if you're first time visitor going through the going through the cloud application. But if you're a power user like much of the community is, um, and you're leveraging the Python API pretty heavily, it, it leaves a lot of um, um, uh, leaves a lot of mess around by creating these default objects. So we're uh, we're cleaning up those uh, those default objects, and so uh, in the in the cloud UI, you'll still be able to get those automatically created. But leveraging the Python API, we won't we won't clutter up your environment with uh, with unnecessary unrequested uh, checkpoints and suites. And then um, Anthony, who's who's here, was heavily uh, heavily involved in uh, column descriptive metrics, our ability to use um, our metrics and and. Uh, analytics and pull table information um, to be able to let you see what's happening and uh, see what's happening inside the table to create expectations from. Now we can actually create expectations from that, which is pretty exciting um, in the cloud UI. So some really interesting, really interesting stuff that's going to come out of that um, as we continue to exercise that part of it. Still coming up, um, uh, still coming up is our ability to uh, do batches and splitters inside of uh, inside of the cloud application, cloud application from the UI. Taken a little bit longer than we expected, but we wanted to make sure that it's uh, continuing to be compatible with uh, with the open source. Um, so we're going to start. We're starting with just a time based splitter, um, and then we'll be able to add all the different types of splitters that uh, are supported in the open source libraries over time. And it was really important for us to get the foundation right in that visualization. Um, and then another really exciting one that's that's just around the corner about to get unlocked is the ability um, to to see the history of changes. So you'll be uh, inside of the UI around expectations. So you'll be able to see the who, what, where, why, and when of changes in those expectations, and um, and be able to have a historical record of 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 things that that follow your data. There's some other stuff that will be coming down the line as well that's going to continue to support this idea that you get to see um, everything around your uh, the histo history of your environment. So we're really excited. This is, this is a big month for us. Um, obviously, it's a short month in the U.S. with um, and and many other parts of the world with the holidays. Um, but the team is is moving moving hard and fast and and getting a lot done. So uh, January is going to be very very exciting. I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of interesting stuff. So uh, that's all that's all I have. Uh, thanks everyone for your continued support and um, and I'm on Slack if you ever need to talk to me. Sorry, I was muted and I was trying to find the unmute button. Uh, thanks so much, Renan, for those updates. Okay, um, I just have a couple quick announcements. Um, one is that um, PRs are paused until the 1.0 release. Um, and the reason behind that is, well, if you were at the last community meeting and we posted about it on Slack as well, and uh, you'll hear more about it today, um, we're moving towards GX 1.0. So we'll be updating the API and code base uh, quite a bit over the next few months. And we don't want people to spend time on um, contribution efforts that end up having breaking changes soon after. Um, so looking forward, we'll be really excited to start uh, resume accepting PRs after the 1.0 release um, and yeah, in the meantime, we really appreciate you understanding as we make this final big push uh, towards the milestone. And then I actually have another announcement, which I forgot to um, put a slide on, but I'll just mention it quick, which is that there will be um, a week, I'm just looking up what the dates are, <laughs> uh, where we will be uh, not in the office. What are those dates? It's the 20... 2nd to 29th, 20. I will be posting about it in announcements. <laughs> um, but basically, I think it's like the week between uh, Christmas and New Year's. Um, so you won't be seeing as many responses in the Slack at that time. I can confirm 25 to 29. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So now, um, Moving on, we'll pass it on to James to talk a little bit more about Great Expectations 1.0. Uh, 
I will stop sharing my screen and you can feel free to take it over. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to, to be here. And for this time, what I am hoping to do is have this be a little bit presentation, but also a lot of bit listening. So um, I'm going to ask some questions along the way. And if you'd be willing to just chime in and, and share how things are landing for you, if you're excited, dismayed, surprised, um, I would love to get to hear all of that. What I'm going to do is walk through um, basically two workflows that are existing GX workflows. So from a functional perspective, there's no difference, but uh, I want to walk through specifically how the Python API will be different, uh, or at least how we expect it to be different right now in 1.0. Um, and like I said, uh, get to hear from you all in, in that. Um, so let me start sharing screen. Uh, are you seeing hopefully a big window of code? Yes. All right. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do with the Python API is make everything just a little bit more explicit so that it's very clear what you are doing with a line of code and, um, also, that's very clear how to do a particular task. So there should be basically one way to do a task when possible. What um, what I'm what I want to show here is a, first a really minor difference. If you if you use the Quick Start Guide today, and you call read CSV, the object that's returned is a validator object. And what we've heard is that the validator object is uh, very difficult to reason about because it's kind of doing two different tasks. One is helping you to build an expectation suite and the other is actually validate, running validations. So we're kind of completely disentangling those tasks so that when you're running validations, it's gonna be very clear that you're running a validation. And when you're adding expectations to an expectation suite, it's gonna be very clear that you're adding expectations to an expectation suite. Part of the way that that's going to happen um, is really kind of making the validator more of a background object. So you won't really need to see a validator or interact with it um, directly. Instead, you'll be able to interact directly with a batch. Um, and sorry, I've got helpful comments popping up here. Um, uh, James, maybe also make the text a little bigger if you could. Absolutely. How's that? Uh, yep, better. Great. In this room, has there anybody who, like, has anybody already noticed or like been bitten by challenges with the validator or on the other hand, think to themselves, man, I really love the way this works? And okay, all right. I'm gonna go with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with uh, with we're open to changes. Um, so okay. So first thing then, value are sort of uh in the background. Next thing to note is um, we're asking for or we're we're, we're instantiating expectations more explicitly as as objects. Part of the reason to do this is that it lets us just uh have a lot better typing throughout the library. So from a serialization, deserialization perspective, it becomes a lot easier to manage. But um, another big benefit is that uh, all of the expectation parameters now are exposed as the actual type of the parameter. So for example, if we have this, like we, we have this mostly parameter um, and you know that's a, a float. So whereas before, to change a mostly parameter required running this expectation suite update expectation and constructing a patch. It's now really, really simple. It's just one line, just update the expectation. At the same time, when we want to add expectations to an expectation suite, it's a much simpler operation because we're, or much more explicit, I should say. It's not necessarily simpler. In fact, it kind of requires an extra line of code. But um, it's more explicit because we're saying, all right, take this expectation that we have constructed and then let's explicitly add it to the suite. You can add another one to the suite. And at the end of doing this, we have a suite with 
two ba two expectations in it, and we can validate those two expectations explicitly uh, as part of uh, a, you know a, an operation directly on the batch. I'm going to go ahead and give myself time to pause again because I'm I'm curious again how uh, these changes whether any of these changes are like uh, you know you're thinking this is obvious no surprise uh, or this is great I love it or I have some concern because I was using a feature in a particular way before. I think this feels way clearer than what it was. Like I I like that the reading creates a batch. And then the language to actually run the validation is clear and the command is like precise. So batch that validate. It's it's much clearer than it was. And what I was hope I, I, I was hoping it to be clearer and now it seems to be. Yay. So I'm All liking right. it. <laughs> awesome. And, and and I see from Bish thumbs up. Thank you for that too. Okay. Um, the next place then that I want to go is into the way that you configure great expectations to actually uh, get a batch of data in the first place, like to, to decide what to validate. And in this case, the feedback that we're reacting to primarily is around like complexity of reasoning about what, how do I actually decide what data I'm going to give to great expectations and um, act, then operate on that specific data. Um, one thing that's you know striking is there's a lot of different workflows. I suspect we have a bunch of different workflows in this room for how different organizations work with data. So I'm going to highlight one um, approach, and and then again I'm going to take the liberty of some pauses here and uh, be very curious how um, how you see the changes. So um, are people in this room already familiar with the fluent data sources, like the the most recent generation of data source available in Great Expectations? I'm seeing I'm seeing some some uh, some gentle nodding and one and one thumbs up. I'm going to just take a second to to remind. So, in a in fluent data source, the primary thing that's um, different from from in the past is that adding a data source is um, much more tuned to the specific data source. So we're we're calling this specific add Postgres uh, function, and by doing that, we're um, making sure that all the assets we create under it are are aware of Postgres specific semantics and name. Um, same thing is true for pandas and so forth. So like all the asset types can be much more uh, well tuned to specific use cases. In this case, um, we've got a data source, and then we're adding an asset. We're using our beloved taxi data, so we're just pointing it at the the taxi. Uh, table inside of our Postgres database. Um, but you'll notice that there's a, a, an important new layer that's being added, which um, at this point we're calling batch config. This is a, still a provisional name. But the um, intent is to allow you to be able to def point at a specific data or specific part of, of your data source. So that's like, again, like a table, or it could just be like a namespace, like this is my um, user's data that I get updated uh, every day. And um, and then separately define how that data should be uh, viewed and split up for batches. So um, is anybody in here using batches today or excuse me, splitters today to define batches or is everyone using runtime batches? Runtime data connectors. I will actually any... admit that I'm I'm separating the batches with the, using the options that it holds. Um, I know that the splitters are a way easier option. I think it's quite underused uh, option the splitters, which like this example could be really helpful. And if there's a clear documentation about it too. Okay. I know we don't always ask for a lot of feedback in the community meeting. It's usually a lot more presentation. So uh, to totally get that if nobody wants to speak up. But would anybody be willing to share? So is somebody using uh, runtime data connector? Is anyone using runtime data connector in here? That one's not. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, in our side, we are we are using runtime data connectors to Spark data frames. Okay. 
And so you're currently getting the Spark data frame on your own. You're building it and then passing yeah. it in already built. Yeah. We explored the, the splitters and, and ways to split the batches, but we, we still didn't go that way yet, at least. Do you use the same split of your data for any other processes? Like, is it part of the, is that part of the overall data processing framework or is it only part of the, uh, the, uh, validation steps? Yeah. Usually we have, uh, we have, uh, two ways and it is a, yeah, it, it's part of, of the processing. Either we are like, um, onboarding data, integrating data, and then validating the data we are integrating before, uh, we write it into the target. So we want to validate the entire batch of data that we are loading, or we are validating data that was previously integrated. But again, as you described, we build the data frame before, so we build kind of the batch and then we want to validate it all. Okay. So, um, in that case, like the, the, you know, basically you'd be, you'd be using no splitter. I think that what, what, what I'm, uh, what I, by ask here is. I think I'd love to get a little bit deeper on understanding what makes sense to you for names for that process. And specifically when you're building the data frame as part of your overall workflow, um, you know, do you, do you already know I'm going to be building that data frame on a daily basis or weekly basis, or is it just like the new data since I last processed it? Yeah, it depends, uh, but uh, most of the times it's probably the Delta. Yeah. Yeah. The Delta this is a new data. Okay. So I think that's been one of the areas that, um, is most like has been difficult for, for people to reason about in GX. Um, and you know, I think the part of the challenge is the concept of the batch being something that comes from the data, uh, versus I think in your case, the concept of the batch being something that comes from the processing. Um, it has been ambiguous. Um, I don't think, so this code, this code that's up here today is like, is, is oriented around the batch being something from the data. So I I'll need to, to provide an example that is more targeted towards the specific use case of, uh, processing data that's coming from, or wh where the definition of the batch is a Delta, or it's something coming from your, uh, processing pipeline. But actually, frankly, the fact that that's an important case to be highlighting in our quick start, which I... I think is something that a lot of users are doing. Um, is that that's a, that's an important case. The thing that's I, the thing that's been um, challenging for users in that workflow is that it's more difficult to get historical metrics that you could use to define expectations in the first place, right? Because you're sort of only looking at one snapshot in time, so it, it sort of limits your ability to identify trends. In your case, uh, Jose, if I can if I can keep picking on you for just a second more, um, are you defining all of your expectations manually? You know, basically based on your knowledge of any trends or ranges that are part of the data set. Yeah, most of the times it's the case, but we 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 distinguish two approaches. We have kind of a, a validator approach in which we define a prompt the. Uh, validations we want to do, so the expectations we want to do. And we have an assistant uh, in which for that one, the goal is to get some help uh, defining the expectations. For this one, it was where uh, we tried to explore the multi-batches uh, mm -hmm. because as you know, it, it, it might help providing metrics over uh, an historical period and, and get better decisions or, or even decide the arguments or derive the arguments yes. from the historical data, right? This was something that we were interested on, uh, but we didn't uh, proceed further there. Okay. So one thing that um, then that it's maybe, it's maybe hard to tell from here, but that I want to really highlight is this use case is, is designed to make that workflow a little bit easier. And specifically because we're defining an asset um, which in your case could just be a namespace if it's if it's going to be running in Spark, um, or it could be you know a Spark table, <laughs> and then we're defining the multiple different batch configs, both of which are associated with that asset. So one of these might be the one that's really useful for an assistant, 
that is able to go back and chunk out the data by day and look at ranges by day. Whereas the other one might be the one that you're using in your ongoing validation. And that way, from an organizational perspective in um, in your data documentation and in terms of your expectation suites, it'd be very natural to share suites across those. Um, it's very natural to view the, the results of data documentation in the same place, uh, but you uh, still can have those different configurations. Whereas in the current 0.18 API, those would have to be defined as two totally separate data assets that don't really share that same parentage. Um, all right. So that again, like thanks. That, that's that's very good feedback, and also a good a good way for me to really understand what the what the like right way to highlight that use case is. Are there other things about configuring data assets that um, are uh, surprising or delightful or concerning? All right. Um, Molly, do I have time for one more question or should we wrap and, and transition? Yeah, no, I, I think you have time. Okay. So one more question um, that I, I would love to also understand is in terms of the way that you manage GX code, um, like are there, where, where are you currently, I'm curious, you know, just a poll of the room. Uh, if you are storing that code in a Git repository, for example, like you're version controlling the code that is defining expectations, is anyone doing that currently? Maybe, uh, maybe give a thumbs up. Yeah. Something if. Uh, yeah, we do store uh, expectations, um, but you know the we let the user upload it as a JSON and store it I as see. part of, yeah. Okay. We don't deploy along with that, yeah. And I also see a thumbs up from Lori as well. Awesome, okay, and, and he, he's, I think, one more uh, nod, okay. So one of the things that we're, we'd, we'd like to be able to do is make the process of being able to, and thanks, so God, I'm seeing several more thumbs up. That's very useful. Make the process of storing your configuration as Python easier. Um, JSON works and we'll continue to support that as a, you know, as a part of the serialization. But um, I think what we've observed is part of the reason that it can be challenging to, uh, track you know gx code in a repository like git is that uh running the code doesn't it either necessarily causes a run event like it causes a validation for example on a validator uh, or you can sort of manually turn it off but it's a it's it's a little challenging uh, or it can in some cases be non-deterministic so as a result and um one of the things we're going to do is try and make all of the Python code that you would be able to or want to store in a Git repository easier to reason about. Um, one of the things that that comes from, or that one one corollary that I want to flag for on that, and and I'm I'm curious how we're going to take, um, is the notion that we would sort of encourage people to use an explicit try accept pattern around uh, getting any of the configuration objects that you expect to be part of your GX configuration. So this isn't for expectations, but these would be those data assets, data sources, and batch config objects that we were talking about. Um, it's definitely more verbose, but it's also more explicit and clear. Um, for people in this room who are, you know, are often kind of heavy data practitioners, I, just looking at the, uh, the, the use of these kind of try accept blocks, I'm curious, does that strike you as, um, Clear, readable. I love it, man. I wish GX would provide me a helper function for this or make it native. How to get a an object or something else? I had to take a double take if this is part of my code because I have literally the same implementation in my code, and I don't really like to use the try expect blocks. And I'm hoping that you will tell me you have a solution for this. You're saying you don't you don't like it, so you would prefer you would prefer GX to provide an a uh, kind of more natural or like a more native solution. Um, I mean the yes, because I mean 
I don't really, in general, like to use the try expect blocks. And there's like, <laughs> anytime trying to get a PR in with those, there's always someone who needs picks about it. So I try to like not use them that often. But I think I have a I have a piece of code that looks like that where when you mm -hmm. are defining the asset, you have to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think a lot of times this comes up in the context of when you're collaborating with someone else and you're you're you both are iterating on config and you want to ensure you're not clobbering each other. Um, and also, yeah. Any any are there any other thank th again, Lori? Thank you. Are there any other kind of positive, negative, or indifferent reactions? Hi, uh, this is Bish. Uh, I don't Bish. know if you can hear me. <laughs> um, can you? Uh, I I was thinking, like, if you are missing a data source, my first thought was like, well, that's kind of concerning anyway. So would I even want to add a data source like that? Um, but I am now realizing that we do some syncs using Fivetran. So we thought, like, if a new column or something is added, that's something that we would might want to track, or if a new table is added, we might want to add it like this. So that may be a good use use case for me to do something like this. So we run something to get the total list of tables. If that doesn't exist on the list, then do the try catch and add that table with a sort of a very minimal default um, expectation template that we can gingify gingify. That's kind of my thought on this. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great use case. Oh, thank you. So I have another question here at the splitter. Is it possible to split multiple columns? We have a requirement to be split by, you know, uh, multiple columns. Um, yes, but I think there's sort of two cases that I want to make sure I'm understanding. One is like where you're saying, like, for example, you're, you're trying to split data by, you know, into daily batches. And the information about the day is split into different columns, like a year column, a month column, and a day column. Correct. Um, and is that that's the case you're talking about? Yeah, I want to split by you know year and also by month uh, because we have a you you know the data mm -hmm. is a very large data set. Um, the requirement is you know by split by multiple columns. Yeah, that makes sense. To be honest, I actually don't know the syntax on that whether that is already part of uh, O.18, but it's definitely something we've we've wanted to make sure is possible in the 1.0 release and that that's just us or uh, that's an element of the splitter definition itself um so i think what i'll say is yes that should be supported if it's not okay. already we'll make sure we get it we get it on okay thank you i i spent like a half hour i you know it was not working i need to look into it yeah i agree thank you okay um for, for people who, so Bish, I think I appreciate that use case. Otherwise, like, you know, I think it, the, the, this notion of like, well, wait, you should just always have an, a data source that resonates. I mean, that makes sense. Are, are it, you know, I, I, I think there's part of three, three places that um, I see these data sources potentially being configured. One is somebody just runs a, um, a, you know, line of Python one off generates the resulting data source or grid expectations.yaml saves that second is they could just go directly into grid expectations.yaml uh and and edit edit the yaml and then third is if if you're a cloud user you know you doing that interaction with the ui um are it, how are how are people in this room currently managing sort of that initial creation of a data source like if you're if you're sort of surprised by try accept maybe or uh you would expect somebody else to do it. Where does that happen? And is there, do you, do you store in version control uh, a record of it outside of the great expectations YAML? Yeah, I mean, uh, I push my code to GitHub. Um, so I create a new branch and I have a Python script that adds a Fluent data source and I supply whatever it needs and I run the code and I check that the GX YAML has been updated. Um, I do a test run, and if everything goes okay, I raise a PR and gets pushed, and CI/CD takes care of the rest. So okay. typically, I don't really use pandas for this. I only use SQL data assets and data sources. So for me, 
other than the five friend use case I mentioned, I pretty much know what I am adding and why. Okay. So my use cases, right? Um, we get a um, large uh, files, you know, uh, that goes to the data lake. We read that large file, um, convert into data frame from the data frame to data set. We use a data set to validate um, the grid expectation. Dot, you know, data configuration we create. Um, you know, uh, just to configure the Spark data frame uh, execution engine. The data we create a data set, uh, validate the data set. We don't use a file. Um, that's the question I have. Sometimes, you know, these data sets are very large. For example, you know, uh, we have a 20 GB file. Reading that file itself, converting is, you know, um, it's a performance. Um, I'm considering, you know, just reading the file. Um, you know, I want to uh, discuss this with this forum. Uh, is it the right way of you know uh, reading file converting to the data set? Is it the performance or um, I need to use a file as a data source? Well, based on what you've just described, um, what you what you're already doing, namely using the data frame uh, directly, sounds like the right workflow. I mean, it sounds like the similar workflow to what Jose described earlier in the call. So you're sort of already got a data frame in memory in the spark sense right so in some right you at least have a reference to it in memory um and you pass that directly into great expectations um like i said i think from a, a documentation perspective one thing that i've definitely heard for us is like we need to make that workflow clearer in our uh, oss uh you know documentation so it's it's more obvious how to do that, Dave. Thank you. Okay, that that's validate. Um, and so I think for you know we'll make sure that part of 1.0 is m ensuring that these kind of data source configurations to include that one, the data frame one, are very clear. Um, all right, I I went I went a bit longer, Molly. Thank you. This is awesome. <laughs> I really appreciate time, everyone. Thank you. So I know I know it's it's awkward to come to a community meetup and get grilled by uh, somebody. So I really appreciate people starting to speak up and uh you know even just emojis that's that's really useful if you you leave the meeting and you're like well i just didn't want to say this one thing but actually i do have an idea or this this was surprising or concerning or what shouldn't it work this way uh this is the perfect time you know molly mentioned we're not doing uh, we're not accepting external prs right now but like what that means is we're hyper focus on getting lots of good input. So, uh, you know, this is actually an ideal time to reach out and engage on these kinds of things. Molly's available in Slack. I'm in there too. But if you, if you at her, she'll make sure, you know, we, we get it and, and see it into the team. So thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. That was really great. And yeah, as James said, like, uh, if you think of things later, post it in feedback, reach out, um, and I can also share that link out uh, in the Slack um, that has those quick start guides um, if folks want to look at them a little bit more. Uh, so I'll do that this week. And now um, it's time for our special guest speakers, Jose Correa and Pedro Rocha. Um, yeah, do you all want to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Molly. Yeah. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see it. Okay, so my name is, is Jose and I'm here with my colleague Pedro today. Uh, I'm a, a senior data engineer. Pedro is also a data engineer. Uh, and we are just the, the lucky faces, the lucky speakers of a great team behind this project. Uh, so you'll see some more faces in the end. Uh, so I, will, I would like to start with a huge thank you for, for everyone that helped us with this presentation and with the project overall. Um, other side note, so thank you uh, from our side for, for having us today. Uh, and the presentation is about a framework that we developed and open source, which is called the Lakehouse Engine, and which we hope is an enabler for great expectations in your uh, Lakehouse platform. So the agenda for today is, what is this actually? What is the Lakehouse engine? Um, how does it, uh, does it integrate with uh, great expectations? Um, then we will have a, a tutorial uh, and finally some links, useful links and contacts. 
starting with uh, the motivation for what is the lake house engine then so you all know that uh, in today's world right we are constantly generating data data that uh, it's hard uh, to use it is hard to integrate it is hard to um, derive information from it but it is of utmost value that we are able to do it right so um, organizations need some help for being able to uh, integrate this data to clean it to ensure the data quality of this data so that that they can uh, drive uh, data driven decisions uh, effective and uh, in a faster manner of course so uh, the theory we all know uh, in practice it's the art question how, how to do this how to help organizations do, doing this um, and um, to try to help them uh, what we came up with was with the lake house with STEM goals in mind so it is an open source framework uh, it is supposed to be scalable and a distributed engine for lake house algorithms so it is built on top of uh, spark and it is written in python so we we benefit from the scalability of, of spark um, it is supposed to support different data flows of data products you'll see some examples but data loads and sharing data quality um, doing um, also uh, optimizations on tables and, and things like that so uh, serves also as utilities for various lake house operations and it is supposed to be easy to use and fast to use and to reuse across the company across different uh, teams so it is supposed to be configuration driven um, and uh, it is supposed to reduce uh, the entry barrier for people that don't know uh, a lot about Spark uh, or, or, or Python even because it is purely configuration driven as you'll see it is a JSON file that you input to the framework. So moving on to the next section. Um, so what, what kind of features does it bring? So you can see uh, on the top left side that the Lakehouse engine supports different kinds of sources. So it, it supports supports Parquet, Delta, Kafka, uh, JSON, uh, CSV files, JDBC sources, even SAP sources like BW and B4. So it supports any source that Spark supports and also other custom sources that we added support for, like FTP, for example, with, with some customizations. So it usually acts in a, uh, in a lake house uh, uh, medallion architecture if you if you think of a medallion architecture with bronze silver and gold uh, you can use the lake house engine pretty much in in any uh, layer but we would say that where it is really uh, very useful for now it's in bronze and silver because usually uh, as this is source aligned data you usually have a lot of repetitive tasks and you can automate those and um uh, really um, bet on uh, op optimized code and reusable code. Uh, you see also a recommended structure of a, a, a repository in which you can have your metadata, your schemas, DDLs, views, notebooks, where you have your code to integrate your data uh, and using the Lakehouse engine. Then you can have some jobs and you also have your algorithm configurations, your ACONs, which you'll see that it is basically the way to interact with the lake house engine <clears throat> so in terms of features you see here uh, it is a key in our perspective for building a lake house it is generic configuration driven it is supposed to be easy to use uh, it unifies batches and, and streaming uh, it supports a lot of operations and sources from source to gold so on different layers of of your lake house you can plug in transformations, different kinds of transformations. You'll see some examples. You can plug in data quality. This one is where we are sponsored by, by great expectations, basically, uh, where great expectations come into place. Uh, we also have some uh, the concept of sensors. Uh, so you can specify custom optimized uh, pipelines in which you, you check if you actually have some some new data in your source. And if you have, you process the rest of the pipeline. If you don't, you abort it so that you don't spend extra costs uh, of processing. Um, we also have 
notifications so you, you have better observability and we offer file and table manager activities uh, uh, like moving files, optimizing tables, like computing statistics, dropping tables, things like that. We make uh, it useful and easier uh, with the lake concept. So how, how to use it? Uh, we will focus on the data loading. Uh, okay, so we have different algorithms, uh, data loadings, reconciliation, where you can compare a source to a target system. Uh, for example, when you are migrating some data and you can compare them. We also have um, other algorithms, but today, uh, even for the tutorial, we will focus on the loading of data. And for loading data, uh, and also for the others, we have the, the concept of ACON, which stands for Algorithm Configuration. And it is in a JSON format. And usually you see some keywords like input specifications in which you specify how to read the data, uh, you have a step for transform specifications, what transformations you want to apply. Also a step for data quality, a step for defining where and how to write your data. Then a step for terminate specifications. So it's any optimization or notification that you want to do after writing your data. And finally, some Spark configurations for your execution environment. So below you see an example. Uh, so in the input, you would specify, for example, that you want to read a CSV file from a folder, then you want to rename some columns, then using grid expectations, you want to check if uh, key columns have no values, for example, then you want to write the final data into the table uh, if it passes all the expectations. Then you finally optimize your table and you can specify some uh, Spark configurations like enabling auto merging of new columns. Other example, uh, a, a more simplified one, here you only see three steps, right? Uh, because not all of them are mandatory, they are plugged in. Uh, so in this case, we have input, transformations, and output. And you can see at, at, at the right of the screen uh, the way to interact with the engine. It's an Aiken, like I said. It's a JSON, a dictionary, uh, it's plain text, it's English, and in, in which you specify, okay, I want to read from a specified location, in this case S3, uh, my data is in a Delta file format, and I want to read it in a batch manner, okay? I give it an ID, then I, I can use that ID as an input for my transformation specification, and in the transformation, I want to rename the column from article to article ID. Finally, uh, I want to write uh, the resulting data in an overwrite manner. So I want to overwrite everything that is in the target system, uh, still in a Delta format, uh, file format. And I want to write it in this table in this specified location. And then the framework will take care of everything else. So we know it is important to have documentation. So uh, apart with, with the with the code, we also offer some documentation on GitHub. So you can, for example, uh, search for transformations that are available. You can see the implementation of the code and you can see some examples of usage and even a full Aiken where that transformation was used so that you, you can see how the Lakehouse engine can be used. We are always, um, and we are still uh, betting on improving the, this documentation, but you can see a lot of examples there already. And in the end of the presentation, we will share a few more links on how you can get some help. Okay, moving to the next topic. So integrating with great expectations, what in the Lakehouse engine uses great expectations? So as previously shared, of course, it is of utmost importance that the data has quality to avoid analyzing incorrect data. Otherwise, all your decisions uh, based on your data will will be bad decisions, right? Um, so it is uh, very important for us to ensure data quality, and it is for that that we use um, great expectations. Uh, and we use it, uh, we, we do this integration as transparent as possible for users, uh, since we do all the environment setup in the background and users just need to provide that configuration file that I, I presented before. So what, what features? Uh, do we have in the engine that um, use great expectations? We have 
a validator uh, in which people define expectations in the Aiken and those expectations are validated on top of the data. And we also have an assistant uh, in which we use the onboarding assistant for now. We are taking a look of uh, uh, at the, the recent news from Great Expectations. So we might uh, do some changes here, but here the idea is that we help people uh, choosing their expectations for the validator. And we also have some profiling of the data with, with Pandas uh, helping um, on Great Expectations on this case. Also, as an addition, we, we have the concept of a result sync. So we use great expectations to execute and validate all the expectations, but then we store the data quality results uh, in files or tables. It is The users can specify uh, the format and if they want in a, in a specific location or another, but we usually recommend a table and we usually recommend the Delta format. So we usually store in a result sync to have the complete history of data quality results and to be easier to analyze the historical data of the executions. We also have the concept of failing on error. So you can choose whether to fail your pipelines and abort them and not integrate any data or uh, continue uh, the execution. So we have the concept of uh, percentage of max failures or we also have the concept of critical functions so you can define that a particular expectation for a particular column cannot really fail. Otherwise, you fail your, your integration of data. And we also have a road tagging feature uh, uh, in which we um, basically tag the, the table. We create an additional column on the table that is being validated with the results of the data quality so that people can debug the specific rows that failed specific uh, expectations. And this is what I'm going to talk a little bit more about now. So the row tagging uh, feature, it consists of uh, people provide the source table. In this case, you see that we have a primary key composed of two columns, and then we have column one and column two as well. So people will provide in the Aiken this DQ functions part, and also they would provide that they want the, the, the source tagging feature and they want to derive the primary key from this table. Uh, and we are in this case validating that column two uh, is in the set eight, nine, and 10, and that column one, the length should be at max two. So then with the row tagging feature, the resulting table uh, integrated in the target, you'll see all the data. So primary key one, two, column one and two, but you'll see an additional column, DQ validation, for each you'll see that the overall run of data quality uh, failed. So you see run success as false, but you see that two rows passed, but the other two rows have failed. And you see the reason why. So in this case, it failed because column one has zero and uh, the maximum value for the length was two, but this column has three. And for the other one, for column two, you see that uh, 555 five, five is out of the value set 8, 9, and 10. And with this, I hand over to my colleague, Pedro, which will uh, take you over the tutorial. Uh, thank you, Jose. Let's just share my screen. Okay, so I will be going through a small tutorial of the usage of the Lakehouse Engine. We're going to use a publicly available data set about the Managed Cricket World Cup. Uh, in order to run this um, tutorial, you need to have a Spark-enabled environment with the Lakehouse Engine framework installed. We'll be re reading a CSV in, in patch mode. Uh, we will perform, be performing some DQ validations, and then we will be doing the DQ analysis. So we have the run results and the result sync like Jose just showed, and also an example dashboard that can be built on top of the, the table resulting from the result sync. Okay. Uh, so the first step in our Aiken is to define the input specs. So here we have a, a, scap, a spec ID. We have the read type, which is batch, the data format, which is a CSV. It has a header and the delimiter is a comma, and we define where the file is located. So now we have to define our DQ specs. 
here we have the, the spec ID of the DQ specs, the input ID, which is the, the spec ID. The DQ type in this case is validator. Our star backend is S3, our bucket is a example bucket. This is where uh, great expectation is going to store the, the checkpoints. Then we have the result sync location and table. In this case, it's an S3 and a Delta table. Uh, we want to tag the source data if we find any, any errors. Here we are defining that our primary key is player and match ID. And we don't want the process to fail when we have uh, an error on a non-critical function. So we have fail on error false. Now to define the, the expectations. The Lakehouse engine supports all expectations that have the backend support Spark. Here we are defining two critical functions. So we expect the column, column team and opponent to be in a, in a set, which is all the teams that have participated in the Cricket World Cup. And then we have some extra DQ functions. So we want the, the player to not be null. Uh, we want the match ID to be between 0 and 47, so we have a valid match. And this last one is uh, specifically designed to fail, which is we want maidens between 0 and 1. And lastly, we define the output specs. So we have the spec ID. We have the input ID, which is the DQ spec. We want to write in overwrite mode to a specific uh, delta table in a, in a specific location. Uh, since we have the Acon defined, now we need to import the low data function from the Lakehouse engine, and then we, we run it. This will make the process of loading our data, making the DQ validations, and uh, saving our data to, to a table. Uh, this is the result of this run. Like I said, we have uh, specifically an expectation to fail. So if we go and check uh, our DQ validations where row success is false, we can see we have 19 rows in error. And uh, in this example, we can see two. And uh, we see the player and the match ID, which is which are the primary keys. We have, the, in this case, the column of maidens, which is uh, what failed. And we have the specific validation that failed. So we need to be in sets 0 and 1, in this case, is 2. Uh, lastly, I have um, uh, next, we have here an example dashboard that can be built on top of the, the results sync table. This can allow you to see how many runs you've made, the, your percentage, your success chance, how many expectations you are validating, what are the, the columns that can be more in error, is there a pattern to your um, failures, and things like that. Okay. Uh, so um, feel free to get in touch. The Lakehouse engine is available on GitHub and PyPy. Uh, here you have a, a link to the engine documentation. Have anything to, if you have any questions or anything to add, feel free to start to open a PR or a discussion on GitHub and also the Great Expectations community on Slack and Discourse. And like uh, José said, uh, we are the two that are presenting now. But uh, this is the work of a great team, and kudos to them. <laughs> this is it on our, on our side. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I really appreciate you all joining us today. Um, and this, for the first time since I've been here, our community meeting went the full hour. So <laughs> we are out of time. Um, <laughs> If uh, folks have any questions about that, are they welcome to kind of ping on Slack or what would you recommend? Jose and Pedro? Uh, yeah. and maybe just 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 to add Molly. Uh, so yeah. we would also uh, be working on, on, on the blog, right? Where people would mm -hmm. be able to share the, to, to see the, the complete example. Um, the full tutorial that Pedro shared is already on our GitHub, um, but the detailed uh, content of the presentation will also be be shared. Yeah, and that'll and yeah, be feel, posted feel free, in Slack when feel, it's ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me on, on, on Slack or also uh, in regards to the Lake House engine, feel free to open up a, a discussion on GitHub and we'll give some feedback. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up then since we're already past time. Um, just some quick reminders um, to reiterate some of the things I said earlier. Uh, we will be, we're pausing PRs until 
after the release of 1.0 in a few months. Um, the team will be out December 25th through 29th um, for holidays. Uh, so we'll be slower to respond to things on Slack. Um, and if you have feedback for us about anything that we shared today or anything else you see us posting about, um, please, please, please share it. Um, this is a time where it's, I mean, it's always good to hear. Um, and it is like, especially uh, helpful and valuable to us right now. So please keep doing that. Um, and I think that's everything. I will uh, share this video in the Slack uh, along with the community roundup in the next couple of days. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks.